Welcome to Heaven and Earth. I'm joined with Mark Jones, and we're here to talk well, probably about various things, but I want to talk about Stephen Charnock. Uh, Mark, you have a new book, or a new edition of his book on the attributes and existence of God coming out. Before we get there, do you mind just basically introducing yourself in a way that makes sense for the conversation? Sure. I, uh, I, I had a, um, a keen interest in the Puritans when I first became a Christian and was able to do some, some work on the Puritans, and I still very much live in the Puritans, especially um, Thomas Goodwin, John Owen, and Stephen Charnock. Those are my three go-to uh, Puritans. So uh, as a pastor uh, of a church in Vancouver, Presbyterian Church, um, I like to make sure that you know I'm preaching sermons that are understandable to regular people, but I find the Puritans in a strange way kind of keep me grounded in terms of bringing together good theology and, and practical application for the Christian life. So here I am pastoring Vancouver 14 years and uh, loving the Puritans for, for about 20 years. Mm. Now, um, just as we get going to the Puritans, it might, like, I know that you were saying that you've done a lot of your work in the past, so it's not all fresh to your mind exactly, but maybe just in a big picture, like they're all, they're different kinds of Puritans, right? There are Puritans who stayed in the church of England for their entire life. Some who did not conform to the, settlements there mm -hmm. uh, there are some who i guess came to north america so like like just big picture not all the details like can you just give like the lay of the land about the different kinds of puritans and then maybe specify the one like a guy like stephen charnock how he integrates into that typology yeah so it's it's like to me it's quite important to figure out you know puritan era and defining a puritan and and i think it's it's almost like taken for granted now that there's no real easy way to define a Puritan. I, uh, we have a mutual friend, Ian Clary. He wrote a really good article on the taxonomy mm. of, of Puritans and defining them. And I, I, I enjoyed it and thought it was good. But at the same time, you know, you can sense the exasperation in, in the author as well as a reader because it's um, it's like today we, we get Puritanism maybe through Banner of Truth was the early 20, uh, 21st century. You know, when I first became a Christian, it was mediated through Banner of right. Truth. And then it started to change, I think, and, and I, I myself tried to, to change that. And I could sense, even with friends of mine who are Puritan lovers slash scholars, that we, we didn't always maybe define them the same way. So for me, it was like mid-16th century, right to the end of the 17th century, maybe um, you, some of it would even maybe end Puritanism 1662, you know, the act of uniformity and, and when all of the ministers got kicked out. But I, I think you could probably go up to about um, when toleration was, was you know, nonconformists were tolerated later part of the, the 17th century. You can kind of get there. But that is to say, like, Jonathan Edwards isn't a Puritan would be would be my view. And um, people would call like Spurgeon the last of the Puritans. And I'm like, okay, like, what does that even mean anymore? When you're, <laughs> That's you know, a good point, yeah. Calling people in, in that era, <laughs> Victorian era, uh, Puritans. So for me, it, it, it kind of dies out with um, a guy like Charnock, for example, because uh, he, he, he was born in 1628 and died in 1680. And Thomas Goodwin died in 1680. Um, John Howe, I think he was... 1704 I'm not sure I, I'm just trying to remember but kind of that those late late 17th century guys dying out you you basically have the end of Puritanism which to me was like a a, a bunch of godly men trying to reform the Church of England along godly lines and and so that the need for further reformation in the Church of England was a Puritan and after that he, your anyone's guess is as good as mine on the, the details you fill in. Yeah. Well, the way I mean, I'm not as familiar with people after 1600 than, you know, the 16th century reformers, but like the way I've kind of thought about it, maybe this is too simplistic or the way I'm thinking about it. Like if you're a Puritan in the church of England, you're really trying to reform the church in a way that minimizes how many idea for there are, how many ways that you can differ on non-scriptural things. And if you're, if you're not a Puritan, but still reformed, you would say that there's actually a greater web of things that there are matters of indifference. Yeah. So if I want to wear vestment because yeah, yeah. Queen Elizabeth says I ought to, that's yeah. fine. Yeah, it's not yeah. hurting anything. Yeah. That, that was, uh, that's, you know, what's interesting about that is, you know, it changes over even from the reformation. Um, I think 
John Hooper, he wrote, I'm trying to remember if he wrote to Calvin and asked him about the vestments and he was, Calvin's just like, whatever, just wear it. You know, there's bigger issues going on. Right. But as time goes on and different issues become, you know, people get, they're called the hotter sort of Protestants, right? By Patrick Collinson. And- The um, hotter sort? Yeah, the hotter like, sort. Okay, they're sort of you. more like uh, easily agitated on right. matters. And, um, but, you know, you see just changing attitudes, John Owen on toleration and how he's like, well, we got to make sure that, you know, we don't want to kill heretics, but we got to make sure we don't sort things out in a way where we couldn't kill them if we need, <laughs> right? And, um, but- like Baptists, for example, is a good example. So um, a Baptist and a Puritan, um, you could be a Baptist and a Puritan. You could be a, a, a Pado Baptist and a Puritan. It, it doesn't really tell you almost everything you need to know about their theological stance. You could even have John Milton, a Puritan, who's a maybe an Arian, um, still debated, of course, by, by scholars. And, and then you have Quakers coming into the mix. and all that. So theologically, it's not the most helpful term, but my point about the Baptists, for example, is after the act of uniformity, you know, when you're kicked out with a bunch of Baptist pastors and you're a Pado Baptist, all of a sudden something you thought was a big issue between both of you and it would cause a fight and lack of fellowship. Now you're kicked out together. You're having to do things in a different way. It, it draws you together. So you could even look at changing attitudes mm -hmm. towards one another based on persecution and how toleration works. So it's really tricky to kind of label things over a stretch of 150 years when you see so much happened in those. I mean, look at the 1640s, how much was happening. Uh, imagine t extrapolating that. So to me, it's just, there's no easy way to, to talk about this belief and that when you say Puritan. Right. Well, what is interesting, what you just said, that there's almost a changing sense of intensity on what is most important for unity. So if you're a non-conformist and you're a Pado and Credo Baptist, there's a real sense in what you feel like maybe you could kind of link up in arms. Yeah. Maybe not, I mean, for sure not before then. <laughs> like no, you're oh. guaranteed that would never happen in the 16th century uh, or very rarely if it does. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that's important. I, I think now like, so this is me kind of just being in a 21st century kind of setting. I was born, I wasn't really born in the, in the baptism wars era. And so for me, like, I don't get it. Like if I see a pedo Baptist or credo or whatever, it just doesn't seem like a big deal. Like my brother baptizes babies. I don't. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I view, I mean, baptism is a sign and seal of the covenant. It's the promise of God for you. Yeah, yeah. And yet I know some people who say like, if you don't use this particular mode of baptism, it's yeah. not a real baptism. And, and yeah. it just doesn't make sense. I'm not saying it's not true or false. My point is, yeah, yeah. I never grew up around it, so it just doesn't feel like it's that important. And I don't. Yeah, yeah. Changing attitudes. Changing to, attitudes. To, to doctrines. It's, it would be, I don't know, like in depth studies on this, but it would be quite fascinating to look at changing attitudes over the course of 20, 30 years, even in the 17th century. One thing that is, cons well, that I assume is consistent based on my limited reading of, of Puritans is that they, they do kind of adopt what Stephen Charnock does. Uh, so-called classical conception of God, if that's even a good mm. term to use, but basically yeah. you like simplicity, immutability, eternity, and all that kind of yeah. stuff. So there's, there's still a strong sense, you know, the Puritans are Bible people, but they seem to clearly affirm the so-called philosophical attributes of God. Oh yeah. Yeah. Like, I mean, the Puritans is one way to designate their activity within a particular church context at a certain time. And how they viewed their role in the Church of England, but that's, you know, that's a piece of the theological pie that shouldn't be overstated, because when you look at the Puritans in terms of their Catholicity, and who they read, and where they traveled, and, uh, and all those things, I mean, they're, they're Reformed Catholics, they're Reformed Orthodox, that's, right. uh, you know, they're, there's there's a lot that would surprise people about the Puritans and and if you get things mediated through a, a old school banner of truth um, understanding of the Puritans you'd be shocked at some of the things the Puritans um, wrote and who they quoted and uh, things like that so yeah that's that's something that we need to to recapture in terms of their breadth of learning expertise and all of those things yeah it, sometimes it's surprising I mean I don't know if you want to call these Puritans, but in the Reformed theological conception, you have people who are hypothetical universalists, 
-hmm. not meaning that everyone's saved, but that there's a free, yeah, yeah. Um, but there's a, yeah. Um, there are people who believe in things like baptismal regeneration. Um, there's, there's a diversity that's like odd when you think about how you and I received Puritan or Reformed theology, like you said, through Banner of Truth. Because, by the way, Banner of Truth is, Truth is great, but they're publishing a particular tract, I think is what you're getting at, of yeah, yeah. Puritan they're, theology. They did, they did amazing work in getting good books out and re getting people interested in the Puritans. And they, they, you know, we have an incalculable debt to them, but it, it comes at a cost sometimes when you, you kind of understand Puritanism through that lens. That's a helpful tool, but it's not the only tool. So um, I've just, I realized when I was doing my studies that um, the, the reform theology that I thought was neatly packaged when I first learned reform theology wasn't in fact the case. And I started noticing all these debates among reform theologians. So not only are they dealing with antinomians and Arminians, remonstrants, uh, papists, Quakers, you name it, they're also disagreeing with one another. And, and you see the manner in which they speak to each other is quite um, you know, deferential. And, and I think Turretson calls Calvin and the reformers the never to be sufficiently praised reformer. But then if you read Turretson carefully, sometimes he's totally clarifying Calvin or, or correcting Calvin because Calvin wasn't as um, specific. So one of the projects I had going on with my friend Michael Haken is, uh, is the, the diversity among the re reformed theologians. And we had a book um, called Drawn into Controversy and it looked at many debates in the Puritan era among the Puritans. And then we went to the long 18th century and did this the same thing. So it's, it's also fascinating to see how they, uh, they disagreed with one another. Yeah, and what's they, so they're disagreeing with one another, but there's also so there's the intermural debates, but then you also see, at least in the ref, more reformed earlier group in the 17th century scholastic reformers, interaction with the parallel debates happening in the Roman church. Yeah. And yeah. so there's there's a high level of I mean, I'm using these these words that I don't fully understand, like hypothetical universalism and stuff, but they're they're looking at these debates that are going on in the Roman church that are parallel to say what's happening at Dort with Arminius and uh yeah. And, and it's really fascinating to see the kind of broadness of learning. So when you think of like maybe a reformed person or more kind of Calvinistic puritanical <laughs> in a, in a yeah. more yeah. neutral sense person, you think, well, they just have the Bible in front of them and they're not reading prior writers or even writers outside of their theological tradition. But that's that's not true, is it? That's not only not true. That's like manifestly the opposite of right like that. It, it It's it's quite simply unbelievable to look at who these guys are, are citing. I mean, the, the, the ease with which Charnock, for example, is comfortable with Francisco Suarez, the Jesuit Roman Catholic theologian, who was a genius. Um, but, you know, lots of other guys within the Dominican tradition as well, Jesuit. I mean, it's, it, there's people that they quote. And when I was editing Charnock's uh, work on the existence and attributes of God, those people I've never even heard of. And I just <laughs> look and on post-Reformation Digital Library, you got 240 works, like books that they, and I go, my goodness, you know, there's there's 240 volumes this guy wrote and I hadn't even heard of him. So <laughs> it's, and then the languages that they're working with and Charna spent time in France and he's quoting, a, you know, a lot of Amiro, obviously, and, and a lot of French authors. Um, and then, you know, obviously Latin and Hebrew, but then sometimes they're into the Coptic, they're into the Aramaic. Um, and so the learning that these guys possess was, was quite incredible, philosophically, theologically, linguistically. And that might be used, interesting to note that Charnak, um, and I don't know this for sure, but he, he was outside of the, um, the established church, but yet he was doing Christian ministry, like he was doing pastoral type ministry, right? Yeah, yeah. So it wasn't yeah. like he was, you know, University of Oxford, Ivory Tower type, if that's even a, a type in the 17th century. Yeah. But he was. Well, he, did, he did go to Dublin, to Trinity College, Dublin, okay. and spent time there. He was a chaplain to um, Cromwell's, uh, Henry Cromwell, uh, who was the chief governor in Ireland. And then he, he ended up getting his, he did some education in Ireland. But then he, you know, he was a pastor. Basically, he's a pastor um, preaching sermons week after week in a, in mm -hmm. a church. Mm -hmm. Um, in different parishes and so you know you, you kind of have the same with Owen and, and Goodwin you know these guys were comfortable in the high-end academic side but then they were people who were were preaching to common folk each week as well and um, 
that's what's quite amazing with them is this, it wasn't one or the other. So, so before we jump, I want to jump into some of the theology of Charnock. Before we get there, it almost seems to me that the one lesson from the Puritans could be, if you're in pastoral ministry, there's no sort of conflict between reading broadly, reading people you disagree with, so-called academic work, yeah, and day-to-day -day ministry. Is that is that maybe one thing you can learn? Because it sounds like that's what we can learn. Yeah, yeah. You you know, I would say that um, your when you look back at Owen and, and Charnock, for example, and they're learning and Goodwin and they're reading all of these guys and, and Goodwin will say in a book, literally will say Arminius saith well. So he's commending Arminius. Now imagine today, uh, you know, I'm writing a, a, a blog post and I say, you know, as Arminius has well said, people go, what the heck is going on? You know, <laughs> he's a, a closet Arminian. And, and so the, the whole culture of, of learning today is so, sorry to use this word, but it's so pathetic and we need to recapture a wider culture of learning that you could write a blog post article, for example, or, or a book and, and quote guys who aren't immediately in your tradition and use them for your purpose uh, and not be you know, looked upon as a, a denier of, of the faith, which when the whole federal vision controversy happened and and, and, and new perspective on Paul and those things, right? You had to be so careful who you even quoted because mm. it was like people were looking to say, ah, see? And uh, the Puritans didn't really have that problem. You know, if you're quoting Suarez more than you're quoting Calvin, does that mean you're a papist? Not necessarily, at least that's not how they saw it, so. Do you think that's because they were able to kind of put together, you know, the, the categories of nature and grace in a more integrated way? Like they could affirm simplicity, beside the incarnation without thinking any kind of conflict was there. One wasn't just Greek thought, one was, they're both yeah. true. Yeah, I and mean, it's probably um, quite complex, but I think, you know, if someone wanted to be identified as a, as a Puritan, for example, in the 17th century, that came at a, at a cost or, mm. to be, and so it's not like they were closets, you know, Roman Catholics love Suarez, hate the reformed tradition, but still wanted to be a Puritan. No one in their right mind would do that. Right. At certain times, maybe the golden era of the 1640s as, as they were on the upward. But, you know, it came at a cost like Owen uh, Goodwin, for example, he gave up quite a lot um, in the university life to be able to stick to his conscience on certain matters. So if he's going to say, hey, I'm a reformed theologian, but then go and quote these guys, no one's going to think, oh, he's a closet Catholic. I mean, he gave right, up right. so much to, to be who he was. I remember so, like years ago. I wrote a somewhat, I, if I remember right, a somewhat critical review of an N.T. Wright book and had a pastor then, I think like the next day asked me like, like, had I, have I given my heart to N.T. Wright? Huh. And I was like, I gave, I wrote a, like, a, I think it was a, basically a critical review, like a negative sort of appraisal. And I was like, oh, just because I read the book. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and that kind of what you were talking about, that, kind of, that, that my illustration kind of stayed with me because it was just such a weird thing yeah, yeah what you just said kind of made it pop back into my head like guilty yeah. by guilty by association not even by saying he saith well yeah but yeah. by saying i read him and i disagree here and here yeah and that's why you know i don't repent for my use of the word pathetic because it really is at times so pathetic you know i i i've been through it myself and you know, you, you even quoting certain reformed theologians was a, there were certain guys saying, hey, you can't, you know, Davenant was like the bad guy for a while because he was a hypothetical universalist. And now, you know, guys like Michael Lynch are, are proving how, you know, mainstream and orthodox he, he was. So it's it's changing with all of these young scholars coming through and writing books and publishing. It's really is changing, I believe. But it's it wasn't that way 25 years ago or 20 years ago. Well, it's almost like you're using history like in, in an ideological way or like in a political way. Like you're just saying you're, you're not quoting the good guys in the history that I believe and therefore you're yeah. out yeah. rather than just trying to uncover what yeah. they actually meant by the words. I mean, I think Richard Mahler, you say his last name, Mahler or Mueller? Mahler, yeah, Mahler. Mahler. Uh, he's like just been brilliant on this. And, and because he cites the sources so freely and yeah. clearly, you can't really just say oh he's wrong <laughs> like he has this multi-set series where he, where he demonstrates some of this kind of broader catholicity or broader views 
Yeah, and you know, if anyone understands how smart these guys were and and learn it, you know, uh, it's Muller because he's he's seen what they get up to firsthand, right? And that that's the the thing when you read the original sources and you see who these guys are interacting with, it gives you a sort of humility that you'll probably need um, right now to say, hey, you know, we're we're going to need a long time to get back to this level of of competence. So um, this is, I know this is just way you can't predict the future and this has to be your opinion, but like, what are, what are some ways that we could kind of retrieve this, I don't know, the sense of like not being pathetic, <laughs> like yeah. how we become normal again? You know, I think one of the things for me is, is the, the massive advantage, or shall I say North America disadvantage that students, at school, so it starts at the school like, middle school, high school is, you know, kids are coming out of high school and they can't even write a, an essay with mm. research um, methodology, anything like that. I don't even know how I graduated from university, from, from high school and got into university because I didn't know anything. And um, so we are, we're at a massive disadvantage in North America. There are some schools that are trying to recover some classical learning. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not even talking about classical education in, as a specific subset of how people do things, just classical learning. Like, so that's, that's the main thing. In Europe, you'll find a lot of students, even in Holland, for example, young people, they get kind of pushed into channels early on. Are you going to be a, you know, an engineer or are you going to be a scholar? And you get pushed. It's like the old English grammar school thing. You know, there's this grammar school for the smart kids. And then there's like the general schooling for the rest. I mean, my parents um, were pushed in those directions. And so I know how that goes. So mm -hmm. it starts way younger in Canada. You know, you'd have to pay a lot of money or invest at home with homeschooling to get that type of learning jump start so that by 14, 15, you're conversant in classical Greek, Latin, etc. So that going off to university, you're not having to learn that stuff for the first time, or in our case, even finishing your MDiv and still being woefully inadequate with languages. So that's the problem is we're like, we're about 15 years in our learning behind as individuals because of where we start is a, is a very kind of basic answer that could yeah, be filled yeah. in with much more. I think even to add complexity to this, like a lot of people do their MDiv and attempt to avoid Greek, Hebrew, attempt to avoid some of the more, yeah, whatever you want to call them, uh, hard science type things, like the concrete things. And mm -hmm. then even if you do it, it's like, well, afterwards you can use commentaries, but you don't, like you learn enough Greek to know how to use commentaries, but you don't, you don't pursue mastery. No, yeah. And I'm yeah. not talking about being an elitist. I'm just saying like, you're allowed to read your Greek Bible if you want after seminary. Yeah, like, yeah. It's not no. going to hurt you. <laughs> like absolutely. And I actually I'm I'm uh, I kind of have this view where I would like everyone to be learned and, and theological and stuff and and up it a little bit, but at the same time I think you can be a, a fantastic preacher and not know a word of Greek or Hebrew because it's a totally it's a different thing in a sense and preaching is communicating to ordinary people profound truths now obviously these things help but uh, but when it comes to like learning and writing and theology right, I mean, right. you need those tools but um i think because some people have got away with being such good preachers without knowing any like lloyd jones was was not very good with languages in greek um you just have to read his, his like commentary on ephesians it's it's really amateur but he was a great preacher right but yeah, if you're, you just better be sure you can preach like him then if you're not going to get the, the learning. Well, I can, t I mean, so when I did my PhD, I would say afterwards, I be took me a little while, but I came out, I became a much better communicator. Yeah. And, yeah. and it wasn't because I could use big words or whatever. It was because I learned how to learn. I learned how to think, to, to write. I mean, even just like a dissertation, you're writing a, a coherent argument that is spelled out over, spelled out over five chapters or whatever that all is aimed to fit together to persuade someone of a of a thesis and so you know you don't have to be that technical in everyday speech but it actually just helps you to organize your thoughts and so yeah it's yeah. not really about greek and hebrew per se in fact I, well in, in a kind of a funny way i almost feel like we over like we over valorize these things and so you're like oh he mentioned the greek word he must be like a great you yeah, know, yeah. Thinker or whatever it's like well, i don't know <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not. I like if someone preaches and says this Greek word means that, I'm like, okay, you know, my my daughter could pretty much look that up. That doesn't mean much, but 
Um, but you know, that's not to say, I mean, it, it really is impressive though, when you see all our languages, these guys yeah. work with, you know, butchers yeah. would, would go and meet a buddy and they would decide to have their conversation over coffee and classical Greek um, instead of Latin or, or Dutch. Like it's just, you know, it's a totally different realm of, of yeah. living. Um, and it, by, by the way, one note is that makes life a lot cheaper because most of the books you want to read are out of copyright. They're just in yeah. different languages. Yeah, yeah. So um, you don't have to read all the updated English versions, <laughs> yeah, translations yeah. that are like from Brill and are like 300 bucks or whatever. Yeah. You can just read them in the original. Um, however, you have done an updated English version, <laughs> although I guess Charnock wrote in English, right? Yeah. yeah so it's, it's a, it's a yeah. modernized English yeah. version with a, uh, with footnotes. I would just note the, the clarify my, like to add to my statement, I find books like yours with those editorial notes that direct you to reading hugely beneficial. Okay. Yeah. Good. Good. Yeah. Those I, notes. I don't want to. No, no, it's uh, we're, I'm, I'm all on board with that. And um, you know, yeah, totally, totally. So but, tell, me, tell me about Sharnock's theology. So he has a book called uh, the existence and attributes of God that he never finished because he died died lecturing right <laughs> yeah yeah i mean if you're writing a book like that um it's likely you're gonna die if you're gonna be that exhaustive on the attributes i mean if i were to start now and try i'd, I'd die too before finishing um so yeah it, it, it's pretty um it's pretty comprehensive though uh it's it's a book where um classical arguments are are brought forth on god's existence you know that God is before who he is and what he is. It's that he is. And so there's just a normal structure to how he does things. Um, and it, it really is a, a mind boggling work in many respects. Um, and I think it's a book that if I'm being honest, a lot of people will talk about and, and speak about, but I don't really know if they truly have read it carefully and understand exactly what's going on behind the scenes of Turner. So that's one of the things I've tried to do is, is, bring to life the the behind the scenes of what's going on with mm -hmm. this um with this work which, which is i think often hugely illuminating like i i had read some um john owen but you know just the, the death of death and all kind of stuff right yeah, yeah. but then i talked with uh, an owen scholar crawford gribben mm -hmm. and just knowing what's going on in owen's kind of life really opens up the door to like, oh, I finally get him now. And even some things like, like the death of death in the, in the death of Christ. Yeah. Um, he wrote that early on in his career. And I guess later on kind of either disagrees or modifies what he was saying there. And so sometimes yeah. you read that it's like this pristine final work of theology and, and like, well, no, <laughs> it's no, you know what? It was actually a popular work. He even apologizes for how he writes in a way that's, kind of not academic in that. So um, Davenant's work on the death of Christ is highly, um, highly like, we call it scholarly, but it, it's high theology. Mm. And um, Owen, death of death, we might think is high theology, but it's, it's sort of mid-range. It's not like Bunyan-esque, like mm -hmm. bottom of the barrel theology. But <laughs> bottom of the barrel. Well, in terms of, you know, he, yeah, I know he, you mean. brilliant, but not like it was never. Yeah. Written. And then, uh, so yeah, it's, that's what's kind of crazy is people have this view of Owen's book, but it's, it's not matching the reality of its context. So Sharnock, um, does he move into Trinity or is it, is it on the nature of God as such? It's just the attributes. I mean, there are like, you know, you, you find the Trinity in there, but it's not a, it's not a work on the Trinity. Like Francis Chainel wrote a, a book on the, the Parliament commissioned him to write a book on the Trinity. Um, and so that was a was explicitly Trinitarian uh, work. This one is, is the attributes, um, but you would come away with a Trinitarian view of God still um, after reading it, but it's not as explicitly focused. Mm -hmm. So like, let me like ask a kind of more like a big picture question. You're obviously creating this edition. Uh, is Crossway publishing it? I can't Crossway, remember. yeah, they're the, they're the, they're the really, it's a huge um, thank you to Crossway for having the like, Justin Taylor just, you know, approached me one day and said, hey, you know, have you, have you thought about maybe editing um, Charnock's Existence Attributes of God for the sake of the church? Like they wanted to do this for the sake of the yeah. church. 
and they're investing a lot of time and money into this themselves. Um, now, I know it's obviously a business decision, but it really like they've taken a bit of a, a chance on, you know, making sure we can get this done well. So yeah, this was, this was their idea. Um, well, I don't, I don't think, I can't see why this might be a secret, but they're also doing a new edition of the Institutes for, of Kelvin. Yeah, and I think Owen as well, even okay. his works are being edited by a lot of good guys, uh, friends of mine who are working hard on Owen's work. So they, they really are doing fantastic yeah. uh, work. Um, so, so getting into the head of Sean, like we, don't, we don't have to go like too deep in it for, for this, but just like big picture, how is he approaching God that might maybe differ from what we do today? Like what is he doing in hundreds of pages that we probably don't do? <laughs> in yeah. our regular pastoral ministry if you're a pastor yeah that's a good question I, there's a different like i mean there's he, he he's practiced medicine for a while and so if you look at his even the way he understands god and nature there's a strong natural theology and and then there's also a strong like an analogical theology where he's he's also um using lots of figures of speech he's using lots of different aspects of creation and how the world works and then you've also got his like uses his points of application for how the the doctrine of god works itself out in our lives it also has an explicitly christ-centered focus where every attribute you know is connected to the person of christ and and so you know it's it's really um it's painstaking in detail and it's like he's trying to unearth all that he can without you know he has to move on obviously after every now and then but if you look at like i think his longest discourse was the goodness of god you read that and you actually just cannot understand how someone can think about the goodness of god so um in so much detail it, he just mm -hmm. brings up things you've never thought of so uh even when he will say i remember this one passage it really struck me that you know and i put this in the uh, book I wrote with Joel Beakey, a Puritan theology, that for a time, God showed more goodness to us than he did to Christ. So when Christ was on the cross, God was showing more goodness to us than to his own son. And, you know, little quips like that and, and phrases, it, it really does bring out the, the, the goodness of God, for example, or the holiness and etc. It might be, I mean, maybe this is the wrong category, but it feels correct to say that he's, he's more contemplating God in a way that maybe we do like data mining sometimes when we read the Bible and organizing Bible verses, but he's, he's contemplating on what's being said and sitting back and reasoning through it, presumably prayerfully to yeah. reflect on what, what is actually true. Who is this real God that I'm yeah. reading? Well, that's why, you know, I would call Charnock's book devotional theology, but if you say that today, it's completely misunderstood devotional theology. Devotional theology sounds like, you know, something you'd, you'd, you'd say oh well this just warms my heart but devotional theology back then is basically theology um you know pearson's wrote theology but it's devotional and so that's one thing you can't leave charnock without feeling god's presence and a, a, a new view of god that it, it brings you to worship where some books today are like textbooks right and you just right. you know, this is feeding my head but it's not doing much for my soul yeah, it's a good point. You know, there's a book, I think it might be Edward Lay. It's called like Looking Unto Jesus. Yeah, Isaac Ambrose. Isaac Ambrose. Yeah, that that's it. And like, it, I think it's a devotional book, but it's <laughs> like uh, on, a, and on the scale of like what we might call academic, also massive in terms of his uh, distinctions yeah. and articulations. I, it's, it's fuzzy in my memory, but I can just think of him on Christology as being very profound. Yeah, yeah, I read that book back when I was doing my studies, and that it was, yeah, it's, it's again, you're right, it's devotional theology, but you'd go, whoa, this is like, it's pretty heavy um, at times. Yeah, so what, and this is kind of what we were talking about earlier, like uniting those kind of devotional and sort of, I don't know, academic minds together. Um, well, maybe uh, one last question, and then I want to ask you about book recommendations to, to finish the talk. Um, so if you're like a pastor or church leader or whatever, there's lots of things you, you could read. Um, you can read like every like every week there's a new book on critical race theory or yeah whatever i don't know i'm, right. I'm kind of almost intentionally ignorant of the of the new stuff in a sense yeah. um but so, so like let's say in my church uh if i'm a pastor or whatever and i want to help people out and i say well i could read this book by um 
on, on critical race theory. And that, that'd be really helpful because everyone's talking about it. Yeah. And then it would see this book and say, well, I mean, this is a 17th century dead guy who wrote hundreds of pages about the nature of God. Yeah. So I think most of us would feel like, well, the more practical book is on CRT or whatever it is, just fill in yeah. the book. Yeah. So, like, what is your kind of a, apologetic for, for maybe reading a book like Charnock over some of the popular press books that I mentioned? Oh, yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's quite a traumatizing thing for me as a pastor, as a mm -hmm. Christian, as someone who has read Charnock and Owen and these guys. And I'm like, you know, so many of the problems we have today in the church, it's like our doctrine of God is so anemic that no wonder we're getting ourselves into trouble all over the place. Because when the root is, is malnourished and the root is God, um, you're going to have people who who take the place of God in their thinking. And, and so a lot of the false theologies that emerge that you have to counter with books, whatever it may be, critical race theory or um, other stuff, it's really will come back to a, a very anemic view of God. And you see that even in our worship as well at church, um, an anemic God in the pastoral prayer, for example, in the lack of reading, the, the preaching is, is, is weak theologically. So, yeah, I think to me, it's like if we really want to see proper, long lasting change in the church, we've got to make the root healthy again. And that's that's God. Then we can have a common ground upon which to, to think and stand as we as we deal with all these other things. But I think a lot of these books are putting band-aids on issues and some of them, you know, a band-aid is a good thing at times. Right. I'm not saying it's it's wrong. But you really are just masking up a, a festering sore with a Band-Aid. And that's, people like that. You know, people want the latest book that, that criticizes someone and, and that. And I know myself what sells and doesn't. And sadly, um, a book on God doesn't always, but it's probably what we need. But that's just me being biased and uh, I'm going to stick by it. What also strikes me that God is much more stable than the, the changing issue of the day, like... Mm -hmm. you know the 70s 80s and 90s thousands there's always a new a new thing if it's um the emergent church or seeker church or whatever it is i think that we put all of our i mean i think you do need to treat these things like pastorally but if we put all of our focus on them yeah. at the end of the day we've we've forgotten about about god yeah. like i'll give you an example I, this is a sentence or two that i read this week that was that was published somewhere by a leader a christian leader he said, uh, eternal subordination of the son of God, therefore has nothing to do with Arianism or Nestorianism or Eutychianism. It is moreover an accurate statement of the eternal reality of three distinct personhoods within the single and simple essence of the one true God. Yeah. I was yeah. like, well, that's just obviously wrong. And yet that's relatively normal to say. You know, it's funny you bring that up because I kind of thought that issue died and maybe I'm living under a rock, um, which is fine. For me but you know i was like really does anyone still believe this now after we had that like bit of a debate several years ago and yeah i guess people do but to me it's like there's just no excuse for that view that that view is so utterly um wrong and and manifestly wrong that it's like how can anyone who's a theologian hold to that and call themselves like a christian theologian and i'm not saying those who hold to it aren't christians i'm just thinking it's such a sub-christian doctrine and yeah, you know, if, if, if you'd read Charnock or the guy's Charnock's reading, you'd see very quickly how you, you just can't make sense of that view. Well, yeah. And it's, I, I think, you know, if, if you, you might have that view, and, but you have the right politics and it, it really doesn't matter. And yeah, I, don't, I mean, yeah, I've, I'm. Uh, Maybe I'm that's too strong of a statement, but it's. No, it's yeah, I'm surprised people dig their heels in on that one. Like, it's just so like, I would say, hey, you know. Yeah, we were, we were trying to protect something good there with regards to male-female relations, and we, we overstepped our boundaries, and, you know, uh, it's, um, it's time to rethink this, and that would have been great, but clearly didn't happen for some. Hmm. Well, I want to uh, let you go, because I know you got other stuff going on today, but uh, so this book's coming out when? Steve Charnock? Well, I'm hoping that the, the final edits for volume two, volume one's been done. Uh, final edits for volume two, I get sent back like corrections and questions and stuff. And that may happen in, in a month or two or, and then we, I got to send it back. And, and then, so, you know, we're hoping that 
by the end of this year, like things will be all ready to go to press. Now, how long it takes for them to print it, get it, get it printed, all that? I don't, I don't know. I'm waiting for an update from Crosswit, but the editor I'm working with, who does the like, you know, the more of the formatting and the, the reading over everything and stuff, he he's he's working quite quickly, quicker than I imagined. So. Um, yeah, I hope we'll have some good news in, in a few months of when people can expect the, the two volumes to come out. And you've probably taught me a lot of different things, a book on antinomianism, Knowing Christ, which is your, your sequel to Knowing God, that really famous book. <laughs> yeah, 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 that was, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it, that one's, yeah, that one, Knowing Christ is my favorite. I like God is a lot. Um, okay. Just people have, have really said that one on the attributes, which is me just reworking the puritans and saying hey here's a mm -hmm. modern day english but i have one on knowing sin coming out uh, with moody publishing uh they've had the, the the my book for ages but i still haven't heard back from them but it's you know it's finished i just have to wait again writing a book is is easy compared to like the publishing process <laughs> so <laughs> warning out there to future um authors uh, it's painful waiting <laughs> But again, that's a that's a Puritan. Um, it's a, it's actually explicitly Puritan treatment of sin, which I think in the church today, you know, not only do we need a doctrine of God, but we need a, a, a really robust doctrine of sin. Mm. Well, that's good. Thanks for talking. I'll uh, I I suspect I should buy the Steve Trenock book when it comes out. I've looked at him before, but I never read through his whole mass of stuff before. Yeah, you'll you'll you'll, you'll, you'll get a kick. You'll, just reading the footnotes, you'll get blessed by some of the things. <laughs> that I think, like I genuinely believe that there's um, been a lot of work been put into um, giving footnotes that will reveal a world mm. that most people have missed. Mm. Thanks, Mark.